Ireland and the United States. And we have traveled um, a good deal together and I've tried to help her as much as I can with uh, her job. And I have much enjoyed all my relationships with, with uh, Meredith. And that's that. Um, are you going to say that or am I? No, I'm not going to say that. Uh, well, it says JR. Okay. Uh, we'll tell you at the end, if you pay attention, if we see no nodding off, no looking at your phone, no yawning, no thumb twiddling, the question we always get asked, which is, how did we meet? Um, and if time permits, we'll also tell you what cultural differences we find most interesting or amusing or downright annoying, okay? And so now John is the master of ceremonies and he's going to ask the questions and probably uh, help answer them. And I think, I think uh, they've been grouped together and we're starting at, at the uh, beginning and we'll just see how the time, time goes. My job, I see, is to try and stop a talking too much, but I don't think I'll be very successful at that. How did you decide to become an English teacher? Um, I decided to major in English because I just loved reading. And I did not want to be a teacher. Uh, when I was coming along, you could be a teacher, you could be a nurse, you could be a secretary, you could work in the church, uh, or you could be somebody really odd who didn't do one of those three things, four things. Um, my mother wanted me to be a teacher. She was a lovely mother who never demanded unreasonable things for us, but she just wanted me to get a teaching license. I wanted to be a journalist. I did um, uh, summer work for the Charlotte Observer when after my freshman year, I wrote what I thought I was, a, was a wonderful story about a gentleman in Statesville who was losing his sight and I turned it in and my editor said, I thought he was depressed. And I said, well, he is. And he said, well, you didn't say so. And I said, well, he's a very proud man. It would hurt his feelings. Uh, he leaned over at me and said, you need to be a blankety blank social worker. Journalists tell the truth. It was the best career advice I ever got. <laughs> I gave up being a journalist. I didn't know exactly what I was going to be, but I was going to get my teaching certificate to get my mother to be happy. And the first day I student taught at Apex High. Apex at the time was a rural town. The high school graduated 55 students. And I fell truly, madly, deeply in love with teaching. Did my mother say, I told you so many times. How did you get from being a high school teacher to a Meredith faculty member? Um, I went, state started a master's degree program in English. And um, I went, was able to be a teaching assistant. And so that paid my expenses. And I did a master's degree there. And after I finished that, I did what I think professionally is the smartest thing I've ever done. I went back to Apex High School the year the two high schools consolidated, the black school and the white school. I had grown up in a segregated South. I remember uh, white only on signs. I remember when uh, water fountains had a racial designation and the chance to be involved with a school that was, depending upon who showed up that day, basically 50% black and 50% white. Uh, I hope I taught the kids something, but boy, did they teach me lots of things that I'm so very glad I got to know. And then ironically, when the um, English ed person retired at Meredith, Norma Rose thought, well, she's taught in real high school. Uh, I'll, she has a master's degree. I'll see if she would like to teach. I actually thought she had the wrong person. Um, I thought when I walked in the door, she would go, oh, <laughs> you're not who I thought you were, because I was not her best student. Um, and it's a very different time. Those teachers were quite rough on us. Uh, so when she seemed to know who I was and hired me, uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Okay. How did you become head of the English department as the youngest person in it? Uh, that's a good question. I wasn't the smartest. Uh, we had two absolutely brilliant, brilliant folks. I wasn't the best teacher. In fact, John came in my office one day and said to me, do you want to know who's the best teacher in your department? 
and I oh, thought the best, the funniest. Well, he says the funniest. I remember the best. I thought surely he was going to name me, and he said Suzanne Britt. Okay, so <laughs> no illusion. I was the best teacher. Uh, I thought I was the best dressed. Now think about an English department. It doesn't take much to be the best dressed. And then I hired Nan Miller, who some of you will remember, and that did it. No longer even best dressed, but I think the skill set I had. Uh, I'm looking right now at Butters. I could herd cats. Uh, I could get a, a herd of very independent-minded people who were very smart and competent, uh, eventually to go in more or less the same direction. What one book did you most want your students to read and uh, why, and has that changed? One of uh, the questions that got sent in was from a student who remembered that it was Tony Morrison's Beloved. And I would still want that to be the uh, book students read. It's a tough book. Um, it's set among a, a slave community after the end of the Civil War. Um, they had suffered all of the horrors that went with slavery and they were trying to move forward in their lives. And it's a book where uh, indeed love is the answer, not, not love with little hearts that we can send in emails to people, but love toughly earned and uh, applied through many, many challenges. I could never read the end of the book to my class. I thought of it in poetry because yes, I, I- Well, I, got on. I did what you told me to and I typed in my name and that got me on. That wasn't Parks, was it? No, that was that Ann Whitford. Oh no, it's my neighbor across the hall. <laughs> and I'm, I muted her, sorry. Okay, it's all right. Um, so uh, I couldn't read the end because I knew I'd cry and embarrass my students. So I used to time the class so that I had them read that silently to themselves just as the bell was ringing. And then they were the ones with tears, not their teacher. But I was pleased to read that um, a survey of some of our most noted writers still thinks that's the best book written uh, in the last 30 years. Any, uh, any others? Uh, I, if you've not read the uh, Elena Ferrante, My Brilliant Friend series or seen it on, I think it's on Netflix. No, I think maybe it's Amazon somewhere. If you email me, I can tell you. Uh, that's set in uh, Naples and it's about young girls growing up in very challenging times in Italy. So you get the whole Italian context and uh, it, it's a four novel series. Read it in order. I made that mistake. <laughs> I just got the book off the shelf and read the third one and then I was thoroughly confused. Uh, but those two books and someone asked about the poets I liked and they're the ones I always liked. I still like Yeats and Hopkins and Seamus Heaney and Carlos Williams and Wallace Stevens. What do you see as your principal achievement as head of the English department all those years ago? Oh, that's very easy to answer. I taught freshman English to Jo Allen <laughs> and she was my uh, advisee. So um, she of course has been wonderful at Meredith, our first alumni president. She has faced a number of challenges, uh, some of which she could not have imagined in her wildest dreams. Uh, you, you know what we're talking about right now. And she has always, always, always done the right thing and honored our students and brought the faculty along. Uh, the, and bringing the faculty along is not always easy, okay? Uh, true, Ellen, <laughs> she's not. Um, and the other thing is I hired Jean Jackson. And so there are those two Meredith alums sitting in Johnson Hall. And I would say they were my principal achievement. Are and, you telling the story about uh, Jean? Somebody asked about, <laughs> this is a Jean Jackson story, uh, about uh, their memory that I brought a cow on campus and they wanted to be, I <laughs> uh, have that clarified for them. When Meredith did a large celebration for the bicentennial of the Constitution, all of the people in Johnson Hall, I noticed Jean is now there herself, but she was just a humble assistant professor at the time, 
um, assign themselves to the great parts, Martha Washington, Dolly Madison, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Betsy Ross. Sheen and I were asked to be milkmaids, okay? <laughs> we didn't like that. So Jean's mother made us wonderful costumes, sort of lavender and white gingham apron and a ruffly hat. And one afternoon, Friday afternoon at 5.30, I got uh, the telephone book out and called the Ag Department at State and got a professor who was still there and said to him, I'd like to borrow a cow. And he said, I've been teaching, <laughs> I've been at State for 40 years, no one's ever wanted to borrow a cow. <laughs> Sounds like something uh, I would like to help you do. And he was wonderful. Uh, so Jean and I went out to one of the remote uh, ag centers and we got not only a cow, we got a cowboy and we got a trailer and we came back to campus. I guess what got the most attention it was not Martha Washington. It was Dolly the cow. We had Meredith students who had never touched a cow in their lives. <laughs> and so we stole the show. There's a wonderful videotape somewhere. Uh, and that's the cow story. We did bring a cow on campus. How did you move into study abroad? Um, English teachers know a great deal about England and they like taking students there. And Roger Crook asked me uh, if I would um, be a faculty member on the program. It was the second or third year that Meredith had one. And that was 1975. And in 77, um, it's when the director rotated, he asked if I would direct the program. And I took two senior faculty members <laughs> We knew a whole lot about everything, uh, more than I did, but again, it's back to, I think, herding cats and a group of students. And um, our, my mother came to Raleigh because she thought I looked like a hippie and that the parents would see me at the airport and refuse to let their daughters leave the country. So she took me to Nowell's, some of you will remember Nowell's, Village Squire, uh, and bought me a double knit pants suit navy with red trim. So in my double knit pants suit, I meet the students and their parents, nobody withdraws. We fly to Kennedy Airport. I walk in and I say, I'm Betty Webb with Meredith Group. How can we most expeditiously check in? And the woman at the desk says, your flight has been canceled. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say, Are, do you see my pants suit? <laughs> you cannot <laughs> cancel my flight. Uh, it was canceled. Um, we were rescheduled on an airline that no longer exists, one that canceled us, thankfully no longer exists. Um, it took uh, about, I guess, 30 minutes to get around to the other side because the students all had, you could carry 70 pounds of then. They all had 70 pound suitcases. We couldn't get on the shuttle bus because they would pick up their suitcases, wedge into each other. <laughs> We finally had to take taxis. One group paid, and we could see the other terminal around the horseshoe. One group paid $8 for their taxi. One group paid $35. That was lesson number one. Never get in a taxi without asking how much it cost. So we made it to um, England. Um, I, I, this story is just too terrible to tell. Uh, one of the students was involved in an accident. Uh, at the airport. Uh, I'm in an ambulance, you know, they go nya, 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 across London, uh, having been there for about 10 minutes while the other faculty member takes the group on the bus to our residence hall. So um, that was our beginning. Our ending, we spent the night on the floor of Gatwick Airport because the flight had been canceled again, and we didn't leave until the next morning at five o'clock. Um, so off we head, the pilot comes on and says, um, we're returning to Gatwick. Uh, our landing gear is stuck in the down position. It'll be too much drag moving across the ocean. 
and we'll run out of gas. So we, having spent the night on the floor of the airport, we returned. Um, so after that, um, I knew a whole lot that I hadn't known <laughs> before <laughs> that became very useful. Um, and the main thing I learned was to tell students in the middle of a disaster that disasters make good stories. Nobody ever enjoys hearing, I went to Paris for three weeks and everything worked out just fine. Yawn, okay. So a pickpocket, uh, a missed flight, a train that you got on the wrong train and went to the wrong place, uh, you got, didn't get off at the right time, all those are good stories. So that was my introduction. And then I just evolved into the eventually a full-time job as study abroad grew nationally and grew at Merida. The bad news is we've got through six questions so far. Share with us your fondest memories of your students' experiences abroad. Oh, I've I mean, got, this could go on. Uh, yes, I was going to say, I really had to cut. Um, th there's a category, several categories. One was watching a student who had grown up aware that she had European ancestors or relatives that she had never met, and she had planned carefully to meet those. One's a student named Monica in Zaina. She would be happy for me to tell you her name. We're still very much in touch. Uh, she'd grown up in Richmond trying to explain how you could possibly have the name in Zaina instead of Johnson, Smith, Webb, or Rose. Uh, and she had a trunk in her attic that had letters from her Sardinian family. She wrote all of them in English, a letter, basically saying, I'm coming to Italy and I'd like to come meet you. She heard back from two or three of them and she prepared herself, took Italian, and she flew, I think it was the third week we were there with a friend to Sardinia and started uh, what's been for her a wonderful enrichment knowing uh, her family, they've been to the United States, she's been often there, her father has uh, been a, and mother have been able to meet these relatives, and they continue to have very close relationships. Um, Callie Bridges had a grandmother who had um, come from Austria. Her father, who was a GI, was a security guard at the um, American Embassy. They met they married, she came back to Western North Carolina. She had never been back to Austria and Callie wanted to go. The friend who was gonna go with her uh, had to do something else. And so John and I said, well, we don't, we, we've got a free weekend, we'll go with you. And we got off the train uh, and there's a huge crowd of her family whom she's never met waiting for her. And that was back when um, video cameras were as big as, small cars and I, I'm carrying one and we recorded that and then eventually again those families connected through Cali. So that's one category, uh, meeting family. Meeting famous people. Uh, I was coming into Meredith to speak to uh, the Board of Associates, uh, sort of fundraising uh, agenda and I ha I'd written a talk that really pulled things out of students' applications uh, the the um, scholarship committee had met the night before. We didn't have enough money to buy airplane tickets for every high need student. And I don't have the conclusion to this talk. I have everything but that, but I've got the whole morning to write the conclusion. I open my email and Amanda Deutscher writes me about having met Nelson Mandela. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a wonderful, funny story. They gate crashed a party for him. They just saw cars turning into where he was known to live. So they decided they would follow. They sat down at a, a table. Obviously there was getting ready to be a picnic or something. They just wanted to glimpse him. And someone came over and said, uh, actually, this is Mr. Mandela's table and he's on his way. And then they confess, we're not supposed to be here. We just want to see him as he appeared and talk to them. And Amanda writes and concludes her account by saying, that day I felt I had been truly blessed. Well, I'm a woman looking for a conclusion, okay? <laughs> I got it. So normally, if I think I might get teary when I'm reading something, I'll write breathe and then I can sail past it. 
but I didn't write breathe and my voice broke on blessed. And a gentleman in the, uh, uh, at the dinner lunch came up afterward and handed me a check and said, um, when you said, when your voice broke on blessed, I looked around the room and thought how blessed we all were. And I just want to make a, a contribution. And I work for a company that will do matching funds. And I opened his check and it was for $5,000. So I had $10,000 and the airline tickets paid for. So that's from Amanda meeting Nelson Mandela. Um, when Nelson Mandela was released from Robben Island, the first time he came back to England, he, uh, they closed Trafalgar Square, which had only happened once after the war. On Trafalgar Square is South Africa House, where protesters had protested four years for 24 hours a day. So he, on the balcony of South Africa House, spoke. And the day he died, the students who went with us to hear him, and it wasn't the whole group, I let them choose. The students who went, every one of them got in touch with me because they had had this experience with him and it meant so much. So that students meeting famous people, another students meeting famous people, Sarah Margaret Tullis and her friends Paige and Kelly um, were we all went over to Kensington Garden to see the dedication of the Diana Fountain. The Queen spoke there. Uh, we saw her, we took our pictures, and my picture, I can say the green dot is the Queen. That's how close I got to her. <laughs> okay, most of us go back for lunch where we're staying in London, and three students uh, don't. They linger, they think maybe she'll do a walk about. And about an hour after we get back, we're still in the dining hall. They come in. The Queen had come very close doing a walkabout, and Sarah Margaret Tullis had said, with a good southern accent, lovely speech, ma'am. And the Queen had turned and walked right over to these three Meredith students, asked them who they were, where they were from, what they were doing. The English don't say ma'am to anybody but the Queen. So Sarah Margaret's uh, reflex got her an interview with Her Royal Highness. I think the English were even more dazzled and I think the Rocky Mount paper probably did a special edition. Uh, it was quite a fine story. Um, other stories, other stories, other stories. Oh, this is John subverting me. This is a good one. Uh, we're in Switzerland, and John gets the idea that where we really ought to take the group is to the Alp Alpzug in Appenzell. This is when the cows go up for the summer to the high pastures, having been brought in and kept in closed during the winter. Uh, this is not on my syllabus. It isn't on anybody else's syllabus who's teaching, but it's on John's agenda. <laughs> And I, you know, I try to smack him away and say, we can't go. It's nothing you can plan because it's not a tourist event. The farmers discuss it. They look at what's going on and they make the decision to go. And of course, John tells all the students. So um, the long and short of it is when they decide that they're going to do this, uh, there is a rebellion. The students are all going to cut class and go, I give up. <laughs> we all go. Um, it's really quite an amazing thing to see. And at the end of the summer, when I do an evaluation, I ask the students what the high point of the summer was. <laughs> Guess what they say? Seeing the cows come up from the valley in Switzerland. <laughs> and the goats and the huge bells. You've seen the pictures. Flowers. Huge flowered mm -hmm. uh, wreaths on the cattle. And uh, the uh, <coughs> owners um, with their traditional uh, dress and then the Ricola Alpenhorn playing. It was really quite magical. And uh, I could go on and on with things that have been quite uh, fond memories of students studying abroad. It's one of the nice things about them. Well, that's quit. What, that's what I wanted to say. We could talk about this for an hour and we've spent too long on it already. Uh, what do you regard as your principal accomplishments in international education? Start fasting now. Celebrate results tomorrow.
Who's that? <laughs> Somebody's celebrating results tomorrow. Um, the, well, the, I mean, I don't have any accomplishments. Study abroad is the most collaborative field on earth. It depends on so many people, so many colleagues, faculty, staff, administrative support, board of trustees support, cooperation with people you've uh, never seen on the other side of the ocean. Um, I'm very pleased about our China exchange. We were the first university in Raleigh. Um, I think maybe in, um, in the triangle to have a direct exchange with a Chinese university. Uh, that meant I had to get up in the middle of the night and dial uh, phone numbers in China and start speaking in English and I would hear Chinese response and what I imagined was people passing down that phone to the English speaker who would then be able to talk to me as we planned uh, the first visit that we took uh, to China. I took um, John Weems, Alan Burris, and Don Smanton and survived. Uh, I think that's an accomplishment. It's not insignificant. Three senior faculty, faculty men at Merida. Um, so um, certainly the San Sepulchro program um, that now is a year round program and I can see Ellen Good's uh, picture and my limited view of pictures and it would not have happened without people like Ellen. It was Ellen who said to me one day, that this is a really big project <laughs> and that's when the light dawned and that took tons of cooperation um, including Sara Andreini who's the associate director now and one of the most exciting things is the, um, Brooke Schur, the current director of international programs, um, thinks that program is just as good as I hoped it would be and it continues to grow and thrive. Liz Yaros who's in that office also has um, been there. So it's now, I think, a firm part of Merida. Uh, the other thing would be the Tide of Hope campaign, which happened, we did after the tsunami in Sri Lanka. Uh, most of you probably remember John and I were in Sri Lanka <coughs> when the tsunami hit. Um, and people couldn't get in touch with us and they thought we were involved in it. So we came back with a whole lot of power uh, because we were fine. We've never been so popular when right. they thought we were dead. That's right. And so the college was really eager to do something uh, helpful for that. And we raised $125,000 and supported a number of people, three important projects. So those things, but they're not mine, that they're all uh, communal efforts. And you're too modest to say you did win uh, a North Carolina award, but yes, we won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, what is your single most astonishing moment related to your international travels? Now, this is a wonderful story, but it mustn't go on too long. I, I'm going to tell the short version. Uh, it happened in New York. Um, we were in um, St. Thomas's uh, Episcopal Church on Christmas Eve for a traditional ceremony of lessons and carols. It's a very English church, so John was quite delighted with that. Uh, Indian girl walked down the aisle looking for a place to sit. We invited her to sit with us. And we told her a story about a coincidence the previous Christmas when we ran into someone in the airport in India whom John had met for five minutes in Bath the previous summer. The person we ran into was Australian. Uh, how we happened to be there at the same minute, I'll never know. So we tell her this story. We leave um, and she asked what we're planning to do. And I said, we're going to go find somewhere to uh, have dinner and she said may I join you I said well we'd be delighted she was a young med student uh, from India the first person in her family to go to university and she's at uh, in Chicago and had come to New York for the holidays um, we're walking down the street it is teeming with people. I cannot thousands tell you thousands and thousands, and thousands, and thousands roiling and I see walking past me a young Sri Lankan man whom we had met in the first trip we made back to Sri Lanka after the tsunami, Poobadu. I say, John, John, that's Poobadu. And he says, I mean, there's so much noise, he can't hear what I'm saying. And I have just one option, I have to lunge. <laughs> so I lunged for Poobadu, he turned around, he recognized me, I was right, it was Poobadu, and we both burst into tears. He's a young man whom two Meredith students 
um, Laura Williams and Rebecca Meek had met when they went to Sri Lanka. He had a very bright university student, spoke excellent English. He had served as a translator for the film they made that we used as the basis for our fundraising. Uh, they went on to win North Carolina Young Philanthropist Awards for that, as they well should. Um, but uh, the backstory about Pugadu is a Meredith staff member who was um, what I accuse my mother of always, of being proud of her humility, uh, won't let me tell who he is. Um, and uh, he sent a check to Pugadu every month for three years, which enabled Pugadu to finish university. He then got a scholarship to do a master's degree at the University of Western Toronto. So he's from Canada, we're from North Carolina, it's New York, it's Christmas Eve. We've told this young woman about a coincidence already. She thinks we are really weird. <laughs> we can make funny things happen. But the end of the story is we went for um, Christmas Eve meals, so um, two Buddhist, one Muslim, John and me, in an Indian restaurant. I don't think it gets any better or more Christmassy than that. And then the uh, backup story is he came to see us in North Carolina and met the person who had been so uh, consistent in their support of him. So that's the most astonishing moment. How many countries have you been to? How has travel changed your worldview? Um, I don't know, I haven't counted them lately, over 60. Um, how has it changed my worldview? I don't think I had a worldview really until I traveled. Uh, I think if I did, it was very Eurocentric. And it's one of those things that for me, the more I know, the less I know. Um, I find the diversity uh, of ways of being human absolutely fascinating. And I find the things we have in common with each other absolutely fascinating. And I can't make a coherent statement uh, about that. It, in some ways, it's like a kaleidoscope. It freezes. You think you see a pattern, you've got an answer, and then the pieces start whirling around again. And there you have it. Uh, get out in it, learn as much about it as you can, and have a good time, and maybe you'll come up with more answers. I just come up with more questions. The older I get, more questions, fewer answers. Which of the mementos you've collected is your favorite? Oh, well, I am holding a piece of Deruda China, which I absolutely love. It's one of my mementos from uh, uh, Italy. And what we learned the first time we went to Deruda is that the um, clay, much of it comes from the Tiber River head, which is in San Sepulcro. So it just seemed to be the perfect thing. Uh, the other thing uh, I have here, can you see it? It's a stone carving from Zimbabwe from the Tinganinge sculpture um, center, which is world known. Um, I'd seen these in England and I had wanted them, but they were too expensive, always over a hundred pounds, so I wouldn't buy one. Um, but we went to the sculpture park and I picked out the one I wanted from a young man and he said that'll be 25 Zimbabwe dollars. It's about the same as 25 US dollars. I said, fine. He said, you can have it for 23. I said, 25 is fine. He said, 21. <laughs> I said, 25. And about that time it dawned on him <laughs> that he was dealing with the stupidest woman he had ever seen. <laughs> life but that we weren't going in the predictable bargaining direction i've never been a bargainer but i knew i was getting a bargain from him uh, john later told a, a woman we met from holland that i had done this thing and she said to me well you'll just mess it up for everybody and i said well if you think for 25 dollars i can invert the whole exploitive relationship between Western merchandisers and artisans from Africa, it'll be $25 well spent. So I love it for a number of reasons. Having seen so much of the world, what changes would you like to make in it if you had a magic wand? Well, it would take a magic wand. Um, I, I think the thing I, I, I just don't know how we'll get 
beyond is the huge economic divide between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemispheres, the countries that are so um, egregiously poor. Uh, Willy Brandt, who was a highly regarded um, he was the chancellor. chancellor of Germany, uh, one of the ones immediately after the war, thought that 5% of the economic resources of the northern hemisphere should go to the southern hemisphere. Um, and uh, I think if I had a magic wand, I'd put wings on them and hope they landed in good places. If someone can go to only three countries, where would you recommend she goes to get a sense of Europe? All right, I changed this answer 100 times. Uh, I think for a first trip, it's hard to be England, France, and Italy. Um, and I say that with apologies to everywhere else in Europe. Um, I think I thought Europe was very similar. I mean, that it was Europe, this one thing, and the countries are so different and so interestingly different um, that it, it's just impossible, but that's where I would start. And if she could only go to three places in the world? I've, I've rubbed a hole in my paper changing this answer. <laughs> Um, because, I mean, if you want natural beauty, then Switzerland, Nepal, um, the, the wild animals in Africa, that's pretty hard to beat. If you want um, a culture that we are derived from, uh, then certainly the <laughs> Central European countries. But for variety, India is my place. I never understand what I'm seeing in India. And I always discover something about myself that I like and something I don't like. And I can tell you a very quick story about that. John and I had a driver uh, in India. I don't like to do group travel if I think it's gonna be challenging because I really don't want other people, other American people or other European people if we're in a developing country, saying things that will make me want to punch eject on their seat. So John and I will go together with a driver uh, and then we can talk as we travel. Uh, but we were in India, we were in a small village, kids got out, stopped our car, um, and the driver who didn't speak much English uh, said they have something they want to show you. They brought out the brother of one of them who was a severely, severely, severely uh, malformed um, baby, and then immediately stuck out their hand for money. And I understood why. That was the only, only thing they had that would generate any revenue from a tourist. But it was hard, really hard, uh, both to experience their life and to see mine in contrast. Uh, later that day, we passed this huge event. It looks like a fair, and I say, what's going on? And he says, it's a bridal fair. Uh, they're negotiation, uh, negotiating for the dowries for brides. I said, that's illegal in India. He said, doesn't matter, that's what they're doing. So that's hard. We get to our hotel. I turn to John and I say, you better get the key fast. I'm getting ready to burst into tears. And he said, why? I said, because this hotel is so grand. It's just obscene. And he said, do you want to go somewhere else? And I said, no. Do you hear that? No. I hate this grand hotel, and it's exactly where I want to be in this grand hotel. I don't want to be anywhere else. And, you know, just catching yourself out, uh, that, that's one of the, if you can stand it, one of the richest learning possibilities. But I would certainly say India, Guatemala, the Mayan uh, civilization that was there, um, 2000 BC uh, up through, I think, maybe the fourth century AD. Um, that's, that's practically a neighbor. Um, there are lots of places. If somebody wants to plan travel, just ask me and I'll do my best to help you. I think I would say that one advantage of being really old is that we're lucky enough to have gone to these places already. It's going to be more and more difficult to go to genuine places that haven't been spoiled by tourists. But the next three or four years, anything can happen and the traveling may be never the same again. In fact, I don't think it ever will be. Uh, I am um, confident which, that it will be. I hope so. I'm the optimist in the family. To what, now we're on to England, yeah? 
to what English village would you like to send folk wanting to experience village life? Well, we live in Bath and there's a lovely, it's not quite a village, it's a little larger out from us that is available by public transport. So I think that's important. Some of the most charming villages you would have to rent a car uh, to get to, but Bradford upon Avon, you can take a train straight from Bath and land there. And it was um, a, a textile village at one time. And it's quite lovely. Laycock is a village that's entirely National Trust possession, which is their preservation society, and is the scene for many movies. You can show up to see Laycock and find that the streets are covered with sand and that they're um, buggies and horses and women in long dresses because they're making another movie there. Uh, and that's a picture perfect. Or you can go to Beely, which is in the north of England, on the Chatsworth estate where I have friends. That doesn't have public transport, but my friends regularly picked up Meredith students who wanted to be there, so they would pick you up too. The Americans, uh, if I can just say this, the Americans love, and I love, the uh, TV programs like Doc Martin in, down in the Cornish village and uh, Midsummer Murders, where people get murdered every week, but they're lovely people in <laughs> lovely houses, isn't it? And the villages are so pretty. It is more and more hard to find villages like this. And again, what's happening right now is going to have a huge effect. I was reading just today that uh, <clears throat> more and more workers may work from villages and that life will be returned to villages because people will live there more. They won't have to live in the big cities, but we, we will see everything's in flux. Uh, what is the most challenging thing about directing study abroad programs? I would say the things I have no control over, like canceled flights, and pickpockets, um, but they also uh, provide unique learning opportunities, so I learned to get pretty mellow about them. How has study abroad changed since you first entered the field? Um, I think that's an easy answer. Um, the um, advent of the internet um, and the fact that one is really never gone. Uh, I was 35 years old the first time I went um, by myself on an international, just long weekend, I went to Munich. My mother didn't know where I was. My husband didn't know where I was. Roger Crook didn't know where I was. <laughs> I barely knew where I was, uh, but there was, you know, I'd have to feed coins into a payphone or um, be a call collect. That was the only way I would talk to someone. And now it's really challenging for students and their families to have separation. Uh, a mother of a student I walked past once when they were Skyping, I asked her if she would be the uh, parent, poster parent for study abroad. She said to her daughter, you can't call me every day. I'm too busy. I have things I have to do. <laughs> and I thought, Yay, mom. Um, but it's just easy every day to be in touch with people wherever they are. So that's a big difference. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Well, I said, as I get older, that changes. But for years, I said, if I, if I won the lottery, which requires I buy a ticket, which I haven't done, I was going to live in a penthouse in Trastevere in Rome and go to San Sepulcro on the weekends. How about that? Now I think I'd probably look, go to San Sepulcro directly. What are your favorite international dishes? Uh, that's easy to answer. They're all Italian. <laughs> Margarita Tirabasco's uh, pesto lasagna, which uh, if I make it to the pearly gates and that's not on the menu, I might <laughs> might not go in. Um, a good friend, Anta, uh, Anna Comente's Cavallo Nero, it's like um, collards, only better. And then uh, Gigi Andreini, Sarah's father, has a secret recipe for a penne, penne um, pasta with sausage and cognac. Those three things are gorgeous. When you pack, what are the things you always have to take with you? Less and less every year. I, the first year I went, I came home and as I was unpacking, I thought, who did you think you were going to be while you were gone? Because <laughs> I had something grand for every occasion, none of which had occurred, of course. So now black slacks, comfortable shoes, uh, blister treatment, 
<laughs> and that's about it. Here's the most difficult question of the lot. If you were asked to give the commencement address, what would you say? Oh, I, I'm not going to be asked, thankfully. Um, I don't know. As I said earlier, the longer I live, the more questions I have and fewer answers. And I don't think I thought it was going to be that way. I think I thought as you got older, you figured out more things. So I might tell students that. Uh, I would certainly say seek truth, seek truth, seek truth. Uh, and the internet has made that harder and harder to find. Um, there are so many versions of truth out there. Um, and being able to separate them and uh, choose the one that you, that is the truth. Uh, and sometimes finding truth means you have to change some of your beliefs because you, you had based those on something that wasn't the truth. So having that flexibility, um, I would certainly say uh, to be kind, kind, kind. Uh, it's been so interesting in this virus to read. Um, two extreme stories, the stories about people who've been so kind. I don't know if you saw today's news. Uh, there was a, uh, a woman driving her car and she realized that the thing stretched out on her dash was a black snake. Uh, so she pulled off the road and looked quite alarmed and another woman and her son stopped and got the black snake out of her car. Um, hugely kind, okay? Uh, and then you read about people quitting their job because the customers are so rude to them, people who won't follow the rules. And um, so that contrast, um, choose to be the person who gets the black snake out of the car. I would okay. love, love to have said lots of um, things about lots of these questions, but um, I think we've, we're going to have to answer this Yes, last what we've question. all been waiting for. She said yes, it the last really thing. Wanted, that's all you really wanted to hear, isn't it? Okay, how did we meet? Um, I was head of the English department, sitting in my office, minding my own business, and this English guy with a scruffy beard and shorts appeared at my door and said, This is her version, you understand that? It's the yeah. truth. Said, <clears throat> why can't you teach these students how to write? Slapping papers against his hand. And I said, I beg your pardon. Um, what kind of errors? He showed me <laughs> errors. Oh, what he said was American students, of course. So fortunately that day, I had gotten a letter from the student at the University of Hull, our sister city. She made precisely the same errors. Uh, he said, I said, what grades did you give them? And he said, well, A's and B's. And I said, well, D's and F's would probably improve the writing if they think you don't care. Why should they? Oh, if I give them low grades, they'll cry, he said. <laughs> At which time I pulled out my bottom drawer and showed him what every English faculty member has in her bottom drawer, which is what? A box of Kleenex. <laughs> and, said, and if they do, <laughs> give them one of these and thought that is about the most annoying man I've ever met. Um, but I ran into him in England a few years later and he wasn't quite so annoying. Love and hate are very <laughs> close and English and American are fairly close. Do you all know what a bottom drawer is in, in English? Bottom drawer is where the young women um, amass their things for when they're going to get married, like no, sheets and towels and you hope call it chest. something completely chest. That is exactly seven o'clock by my time. Uh, some of those questions one could answer for ages and ages. Obviously, I was longing to speak a lot, but I know my place. I'm just an old English man, and I'm very pleased that I was allowed to take part in this at all. Although I am, in fact, the nearest thing to an, an, an alumnus that there can be. Just as in London, I'm the nearest thing that you can be to an honorary nun, because I've been with these nuns in Kensington Square for something like 20 years. But basically, um, I love the United States, apart from its politics, and, I, and religion and guns and lack of history 
and everything that's much too new. <laughs> but that's all I'm allowed to say. That was a bit more than you're allowed to say. But who's surprised? Uh, it's been lovely. I, I wish I could see all of you. I've loved looking at the faces I've been able to see. I was very, very nervous about this, but suddenly when I'm talking to real people, uh, I've enjoyed it very much. Can we see any more faces or not? Is that not allowed? No, it just isn't structured that way. It doesn't work like that. No. No, nobody went to sleep. Not so, this. So, John and Betty, um, are you agreeable that if there is a question that someone has that they don't feel was answered, sure. that they can email Betty? Yep. And her um, email address is web, another B, another B at meredith.edu. So Our most it, valuable retirement. Right, Please. her email address. <laughs> W-E-B-B-B -B -B at Meredith.edu. And we have lots of fun um, comments that I can share with you. Um, oh. Yeah. So yeah. that'll let us know who was, who was here. Yes. Can you share the ones that aren't fun as well? Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Someone asked if we could do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, actually, several people have asked if Betty will write a book, uh, particularly about um, study abroad. And there are so many stories, but so many of them we're not allowed to tell because <laughs> there's one person who may be embarrassed by them. That's right. Right, right. Well, maybe we'll get to read a book one day. I will not web. hold breath till that happens. <laughs> Well, she's got nothing else to do. That's right. <laughs> so thanks so much. And um, I, um, I hope that um, you guys stay safe and healthy. And sane. And sane, right. And all the Meredith alums too. Yes. So we can only see those um, seven there. Is that it? We're limited to those. Jean Jackson just popped up. Oh, look, there's Jean Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> the cow lady, <laughs> the snake, the snake lady. <laughs>
I'm Karen down the street. Good to hear from you. I, I walk past your house and hope you'll be outside and I can talk to you, but alas. Well, one problem is that you may be able to see us, but we can't see you. We can only see seven, uh, seven people. Oh. As well as ourselves and, um, and young Neil's wife, Denise. <laughs> The, try the blue arrow off to the right of your screen and it brings up the rest of the pictures. Oh, I'd see. love to see them. You just can so scroll that. through and see everybody. I just figured that out. Do you have a blue arrow, Betty? I think that I don't have the latest. She's thing. on an iPad, Karen. So. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Hers is a bit different. Well, we 65 year olds know so much more than you do about the computer. Ha ha. Okay, I'm gonna end the meeting. Y'all send her right. an email. Okay, well, good to see everybody. Thanks for joining. Yes, bye bye bye. All the very best. Goodbye, was, good help. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye.